Hello, thank you for joining us today for our Farm Foundation Forum, Understanding the EU Farm to Fork Strategy and its Implications for U.S. Agriculture. We are glad to have the opportunity to engage with you today on this topic. My name is Sherry Rogie Fiddler and I'm the President and CEO of Farm Foundation, located just outside of Chicago, Illinois. I'm also a fifth generation farm owner operator from Nebraska who lived and worked in Europe for many years. So I'm looking forward to hearing the perspectives today from our US and European speakers. Having experienced warm hospitality from many Europeans in my life, I'd like to extend a special welcome to our European speakers for taking the time to join us today. Before we get into today's program, I'd like to take just a few moments to share a bit about Farm Foundation. We are a 501c3 nonprofit working at the intersection of agriculture and society to address challenges that affect the entire food and ag value chain. Specifically, we are an accelerator of practical solutions for agriculture, accelerating people and ideas into action. The three levers we use to accomplish this are policy, innovation, and education. Forums such as today's are just one part of our extensive program of work which is guided by our mission to build trust and understanding at the intersection of agriculture and society, and our vision to build a future for farmers, our communities, and our world. We rely on partnerships to fund our work and increase our impact, including our Trade Resource Center. So if you're interested in learning more about funding or partnering with us, I invite you to reach out and explore collaboration. You can also learn more about Farm Foundation and our work by visiting our website at farmfoundation.org or connecting with us on our social media platforms. If you're posting on social media about this morning's session, we ask that you please use hashtag Farm Foundation Forum. As we get underway for today's forum, I would like to quickly go over a few housekeeping notes. We invite you to submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. When submitting questions, please include your name and organization. And due to time limits, we may not be able to ask all of the questions submitted, but we'll certainly do our best. This forum is being recorded and will be posted on our website at farmfoundation.org, and we'll send out that link after today's program. If there are any connectivity issues during the forum, we ask that you stay on the forum as these generally rectify themselves after just a few moments. And finally, when the forum concludes, you will receive a link to a short survey. Farm Foundation appreciates your feedback and your time in completing the survey. The EU farm to fork strategy is at the heart of the European Green Deal and its ambitious agenda to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. With a series of policy recommendations focused on creating a sustainable food system from end to end, this strategy will have ripple effects throughout the food and agricultural value chain, not just in Europe, but around the world. That's exactly what we're here to explore today. I'm looking forward to hearing our panelists' perspectives on what the EU farm to fork strategy means for global food security, production, and agricultural trade, and especially how these policies might affect US agriculture. So let's get started. We're happy to have Bill Bryant with us as our moderator today. Bill is founder and chairman of Bryant Christie, a consulting firm helping companies and industry organizations throughout the US to develop, execute, and strengthen their market access and market development strategies. Since founding the firm in 1992, Bill has been appointed under both Republican and Democratic administrations to advise USTR, USDA, and Exim Bank on our nation's trade policy. Bill is also a key member of the Farm Foundation Trade Advisory Council, which guides the direction and content of our Trade Resource Center I mentioned earlier. You can find the Trade Resource Center on our website at farmfoundation.org slash trade. Bill, thank you for being here today to guide our panelists through this important discussion. And with that, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Sherry. I, I too am really looking forward to today's discussion and look forward to the questions that we're going to be receiving from all of you. In the last two to three decades, there have been growing middle classes and what previously were considered developing countries. And with the rise of this new class of middle income consumers around the world, there's been an increasing focus on food safety. And as a result, uh, countries that before had largely deferred to international standards, maybe those set by Codex or the FAO or entirely or partially deferred to United States or European Union standards, we now see over the last several years have begun establishing their own domestic standards. 
And this complexity of standards is not only complicated compliance issues for those who are exporting food and beverages and commodities, but it's also increased the opportunities to use standards that are not based on a risk assessment for as non-tariff barriers. And these food safety concerns have not only been confined to previously developing countries and to new middle classes in those countries, but food scares in Europe in the last few decades have led the European Union to reevaluate its own standards and its standard setting processes. And this heightened food safety concern has merged with concerns over emerging technology and food production and with concerns over CO2 emissions related to agricultural production and to a more awareness of the need for more sustainable environmental practices when developing and growing our food. And all of these forces have come together to really shape what we now consider the European Union's farm to fork initiative. Its intent is to reduce fertilizer and chemical use some will claim that its intent is to restrain technological innovation. Others will argue it is going to drive innovation. Some believe its intent is to deindustrialize food production in the European Union and around the world at precisely a moment given climate change when we need to be increasing food production. And others believe it's actually the opposite, that it is to incentivize healthier food production and to incentivize healthier diets. Now, of course, what the European Union does within its own borders is its own business. But if it begins imposing those standards on its trading partners, if it begins requiring specific production practices or policy preferences, rather than standards based on risk assessments, well, then there are going to be WTO concerns and some of those concerns have already been raised. Our panel today is an excellent group of experts who are going to help us sort through these issues and concerns and to provide us different perspectives on the issues that we've been and will be discussing. I'm going to introduce each of our five speakers. And then once each has presented their perspectives and information, I'm going to throw out a few questions to get our discussion started, but then really invite all of you to participate by providing your own questions. Our first speaker who's going to set the stage for everyone else is Dr. Alan Hardacre. Um, Alan has had a distinguished career in public affairs and advocacy in the European Union. He currently consults with CropLife Europe as its director of public affairs, as well as other companies working on European Union policies. He previously was the director of group corporate affairs at the Imperial Brands in Brussels. And he has lectured extensively on European Union decision making. He's written books and guides on working with European Union institutions. And we're very fortunate to have Alan with us this morning. Thank you, Alan. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. And good afternoon, good morning, and perhaps good evening to, to everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to say many thanks to the Farm Foundation Forum for the invitation to join this uh, panel today. And I'm, I'm delighted to get things started, to set the scene and hopefully the tone for uh, the other panelists and for the discussions to come. So if we move on to the next slide, um, uh, as, as Bill said, I'm the Director of Public Affairs at CropLife Europe. And CropLife Europe has uh, two big vested interests in, in the farm to fork uh, discussion. So, uh, the first is, is an EU interest, if you like. So uh, it's the four pillars of our association, which is conventional pesticides, biopesticides, um, agribiotech, and digital and precision agriculture. So it's representing these interests um, in the EU um, in, this, in this evolving Green Deal and farm to fork environment that we're going to discuss. I would say, secondly, we have another interest in this, which is the external aspects that, that Bill touched on in his introduction. Um, because whilst our scope as CropLife Europe, uh, you know, our scope and mandate is very much European, um, our member companies have a global presence. And so they are obviously incredibly interested in these external impacts um, that Farm to Fork will have, which is indeed the subject of today's webinar. So. Um, if we move to the next slide, I was asked just to give a little bit of a landscape, just set the scene a little bit for everybody. And 
I appreciate a couple of these items have already been touched on, so forgive me, I'm just going to rewind, give me two minutes to, to set the scene of where we are. Um, so first off, the Green Deal was presented in December 2019. Uh, uh, as noted, the objective is to make the EU climate neutral by 2050, so that gives us 29 more years to, to get there. Um, the European Commission stated at the time that this was Europe's man on the moon moment, you know, so this is a a, a huge, big, uh, ambitious agenda that the European Union has set itself. Um, and I keep stressing the Green Deal is about ambitions. Um, so the Green Deal itself covers um, many sectors directly and literally every sector indirectly. And at the moment is requiring a huge policy review and overhaul um, across many areas of European legislation. And that's, that's, that's somewhere where we are today at the beginning of this journey. And it's into that context that the Farm to Fork arrives. The Farm to Fork um, is one of the main pillars of the Green Deal. It was published in May 2020, so almost exactly one year ago. And it itself is again premised on a set of targets. Um, and it's worth just recalling uh, these targets um, as we're going to start looking at the impact, potential impact of Farm to Fork on US agriculture. Um, the targets are 25% of EU agriculture being organic by 2030, um, reduction in the use of pesticides by 50% by 2030, reducing the use of fertilizers by 20% by the year 2030, um, reducing nutrient loss by at least 50%, reducing the use of um, antimicrobials in agriculture and uh, aquaculture by 50% by 2030, it's about sustainable or creating sustainable uh, food labeling and reducing food waste by 50% by 2030. And finally, by trying to ensure that there is 10 billion uh, euros worth of investment uh, dedicated to research and, um, and innovation in this space. So that is a huge set of ambitious targets. And what you see in front of you is the annex of the Farm to Fork communication itself, um, which um, does exactly what it says on the tin. This is about going from the farm, um, maybe interesting, wherever that farm may be in the world, I think is maybe we'll start to see this, to the consumer's fork, um, perhaps wherever that consumer may be. Um, in here, we see 27 legislative initiatives that are foreseen to bring the farm to fork, to farm to fork targets to life. Um, they have started to be launched and they will be launched progressively over the next couple of years. Um, with a likely finalization of this full package by sometime 2024, 2025. So we're at the beginning of bringing this to life. Okay, so um, if we move on to the, the next slide, um, it's, that's one of the reasons, and I think there's three that I want to touch on here, why it's difficult to understand the potential impacts of the farm to fork for, for the US and for other countries at this moment in time. So I think you can safely see from the targets that, that have been set that there will be a significant impact on US agriculture, but it's just quite difficult to be precise right now. Uh, and as I say, three main reasons for this. One, as I touched on in the previous point, um, we're very early in the process. Um, so those 27 pieces of legislation um, are, are just starting. And the EU system is is built on harvesting the input of a lot of different stakeholders. Um, it's quite a lengthy process. So 27 countries have different ways to feed their, their, their thoughts and their reflections into this European system before we can finalize our legislation. Uh, and also obviously third countries putting their input in as well. So, and with many of these initiatives, like with most, uh, with most legislation that tries to bring a target to life, the devil is going to be in the detail. So secondly, um, as I think the previous slide showed with the 27 different initiatives, um, it's quite difficult to tell what the final impact of the whole package is going to be until all of the items are in fact concluded because there's so many different interlinkages, trade-offs and crossovers between them and within them um, that it's quite difficult to tell until it's all settled what the exact impacts will be. And then the third point that relates to this, um, when we talk about potential impacts, even here when we, with regard to the potential impacts within the EU, because I think it's difficult to talk about potential impacts outside the EU when we don't really even have a clear view of what we think the impact inside the EU is going to be right now. 
Um, and one of the main reasons for this is we lack a solid uh, data basis for this. We don't have enough good, robust data uh, to be basing any of our assumptions on at the moment. Now, there has not been a full impact assessment from the European Commission across the full spectrum of the initiatives that we're looking at here, nor, in fact, uh, will there be one. So the richest data analysis that we have comes from two of the panelists that will be speaking after me today, uh, from Jason and Morris, and they're going to touch on this in, in their interventions and, and their work since that first impact assessment that they did. Um, and I also believe Tassos in his piece is going to give a bit of an update on some commission data that is coming um, pretty, pretty soon. So um, what, what we see then in the absence of this central cumulative impact assessment is that many sectors will look to fill the gap because they try to understand what this is going to mean for them. Um, so we at Crop Life Europe, for example, uh, along with some of our agri food chain partners, have commissioned a study to Wageningen University in the Netherlands um, to look at 10 crops across seven countries um, and to look at the individual and cumulative effects of the pesticide, fertilizer, organic, um, and then also a 10% set aside target from the biodiversity strategy. So we're trying to fill the data gap ourselves and understand a little bit um, for our own space, what does this actually mean? So we also know, um, quite interestingly, for those who like a data bias, that within the crop protection world in Europe, there are seven or eight further studies coming from a national level. We also know that from other sectors, uh, from other from other sectors in the, in the agri food chain, that they are also conducting their own impact assessments. So I think soon we'll move from a position of not having much data to having lots of what I might call apples and pears data. So there'll be data that's based on different methodologies with different ambitions, um, but we will not lack for data. Now, maybe that's a good point to move to the next slide um, because. Uh, having said that we don't have enough data uh, and, you know, recognizing the limitations of what it is, therefore, that we do know right now, um, we can still observe some trends and some patterns, because I think it's important that at the end of the day, it's not the data that's going to determine the impact on U.S. agriculture, for example. It's going to be the politics. Um, it's the politics of, of the European decision making process that will determine those impacts, irrespective of the data. Uh, and here, I think we can we can give some first views from what we've seen in the last six months. Um, and notably, here I'm going to take a lot of this from what's been happening in the in the European Parliament, which is a bit of a it's a good barometer for the political feeling as attached to political opinion in Europe. Um, and, and the European Parliament over the last few months has been finalising its opinions on the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies, which means we've had. Um, many hours of politicians speaking, asking questions of the European Commission and drafting literally thousands of amendments. Um, and they give us a very good indicator of, I think, where the political discussions are right now and where they're likely to go in the years to come. And here I just wanted to flag three things, three observations, and they will be in sort of ascending order of concern, perhaps, for, um, for, for the US agricultural space. So the first one is, um, and it's a little bit what Bill started with. The role of innovation and technology is, is contrary to what you might expect, doesn't have a very clear place in the debate. It's still very much up for debate um, to what extent the benefit of technological innovation brings to EU farming. So it's not, it's perhaps not as, as, as you know, it doesn't go without saying that this is going to be part of the future under the farm to fork world. Uh, the second point, perhaps uh, a little less, uh, uh, a little more clearly, is that GMOs from a cultivation, but increasingly from an import perspective, are continue to be viewed extremely negatively. Um, they are subject to much debate, um, and there is uh, very much little light at the end of the GMO tunnel. So, in terms of GMOs offering part of the solution to the farm to fork issue, um, it looks highly unlikely. Um, and then finally, the, the piece that I will I will end on here is something that is a, a major concern, I think, for, for countries outside the EU. Um, I'll diplomatically for now put this as a growing and passionate level playing field narrative that is evolving within the European Parliament and EU farming circles, which should be a very big red flag. Um, 
just in simple terms, from the from the world of of, of crop protection of pesticides, um, the argument basically goes that if the EU bans a substance, uh, or does not allow a substance but to be used by EU farmers, then A, it should not be produced and exported to anyone else in the world, and B, it should certainly not be imported back in on any product at any level at any time. Um, and I think this level playing field argument, as the as the as the other implications of, of, of the farm to fork become clearer of what that means for farmers, this level playing field uh, argument will, will only grow and will have quite a political effect, um, I think. So yes, that's that's where I will end uh, my piece. I hope this sets the scene and the tone for the fellow panelists. And I then look, very much look forward to the discussions um, and the questions to come. So with that, I will hand back to you, Bill. Sorry about that. I somehow couldn't unmute. Um, thank you, Alan. Uh, we are very honored today to have Tassos Haniotis with us to provide us with a different and, and perhaps the European Union's perspective on what is happening within the Commission. Uh, Tassos is the Director of Simplification and Policy Analysis at the Directorate General of Agriculture and Rural Development. For many of you who have known Tassos, um, he has had a 30-year career at the Commission. He's served in multiple senior policy and analytical positions, including the head of agricultural policy in the analysis unit, the deputy head of cabinet for the former EU commissioner for agricultural Fischler, and where I met Tassos years ago as the agricultural council counselor to the European Union's delegation in Washington, DC. Tassos holds his PhD and masters from the agricultural and agricultural economics from the University of Georgia in the United States. In addition to multiple policy responsibilities, he represents the European Union on the G20's Rapid Response Forum. Tassos. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bill, and thanks to the Farm Foundation for this uh, opportunity uh, to discuss with you uh, what I termed in my presentation, the Farm to Fork for you as beginners. Uh, I, appreciate a lot of introductory uh, uh, statements of Alan because it gives me uh, the opportunity uh, to come and try to explain some of the questions that naturally uh, come up when a new initiative uh, is introduced. And uh, having spent 11 years of my life in the United States, uh, I saw Shari mentioned before that she has lived in Europe. At, at least I will try to speak uh, to an American audience with my American English with a Greek accent, if you want. So if we go next uh, here, uh, where are we two years after when we made the proposal for the future uh, of the cap? In fact, it's two and a half years ago. What is the same since we made this proposal, which was under the previous commission? What is the same is, first of all, the need to guarantee and enhance climate and environmental ambition. Already we identified in the impact assessment we did for the common agricultural policy that we have had over the years very significant economic and social uh, successes. The fact that the European Union has turned into a net agricultural trade exporter after decoupling uh, and being also at the same time a very significant importer of agricultural products is the best proof of that. But we have also seen that we needed to do much more in uh, environmental uh, ambition and uh, climate uh, action. That doesn't negate progress that has been made. In fact, if you look at the big uh, five agriculturals in the world, uh, US, EU, China, India, and Brazil, the European Union is the only one that has reduced emissions since 1990. But we have had stagnation in recent years, and we have realized that we need to boost our environmental ambition if we want to meet all these extremely ambitious targets that have been already set with the Paris Agreement. The second thing that is the same, wait, 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 uh, it's not the next yet, thanks. The next thing that is the same is that the EU food system uh, as 
shown its resilience during the COVID crisis. It's not only the EU food system that's shown resilience. The food systems uh, worldwide uh, have shown that despite the criticism on weaknesses that they have, and they have a lot of weaknesses, they still have a level of sophistication and innovation that allowed uh, the world to have food uh, on their table during one of the most severe crises we have seen in decades. And third, because we made a reference to a man on the moon, we do not expect to send a man on the moon in a hot air balloon. The Copernicus system that we have, which is out there and provides public information uh, to uh, everyone actually around the world in a much more advanced way than in the past, observes, collects, and transfers environmentally pertinent information, which is one of the main your elements we want to use uh, in terms of uh, uh, the future uh, orientation of the policy. And it's also, if you want, Alan, an indication of the fact that innovation is not something unknown when it comes to, to European agriculture. Next is what has changed in the meantime. And what has changed is that COVID demonstrated the benefits of common EU responses to crises and risks, and also the weaknesses if this response is not uh, common. And obviously, on a, on a major uh, initiative like uh, respecting uh, our extremely advanced uh, climate ambitions, uh, a common EU response is a must. The farm to fork targets are new. We didn't put quantitative targets, which are, by the way, at the EU level when we made the proposal uh, for the future cap. It was through the strategic plans of the member states that they had to determine uh, this uh, uh, targets without aggregating them at the EU level. What the farm to fork has done is has set targets in order to better link the common agricultural policy with other policy areas uh, in the European uh, Union. But in terms of the objectives that these targets are uh, expected to meet, there is nothing new. In fact, when we prepared the previous common uh, uh, the, the proposal for the cap uh, in the impact assessment. Uh, Two of the four uh, big uh, seminars we have done to prepare uh, the proposal were on agro-environmental uh, measures, the first one, and the other one was the use of antibiotics in, in animal uh, feeding. And the third one on risk management had a lot of focus on climate uh, uncertainties. And finally, in the CAP strategic plans, what the farm to fork has brought is a better link of the delivery of uh, these plans to the societal expectations that have increased a lot in the European Union. Next, uh, what needs to be done to better link the cap to the Green Deal is retain the key elements of the proposal that is currently in what we call in our jargon the trilogues, that is the, uh, what do you call if you want conferences in, uh, in the United States, where you try to bring together the version of the Senate and the version of the House. In Europe, we have three institutions that are involved. The Commission that has a legislative initiative, the European Parliament, and the Council of Ministers of all the member states. So we are at the final stages of this discussion. And of course, when you go into these uh, uh, negotiations, there are elements of the proposal that uh, have the risk of being weakened. And that wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, like as a Commission to see. But second, we need to identify the areas where certain improvements can close the identified gaps we have in the analysis that member states have to do on their strengths and weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats and determine via these uh, gaps the priorities that they have to uh, identify, which are different by the way in uh, member states. And part of the innovation of the CAP proposal is to provide more flexibility in member states to advance uh, the policy measures they think more appropriate, but the specific uh, objectives that they have to meet are common at the EU level. And finally, and that is also very much linked to, to innovation, and it's a reply if you want to the criticism that we want uh, to freeze uh, innovation and technical uh, change, is we want to accelerate the shift to digitalization to exploit all the benefits of a knowledge-based uh, best practices. And I will come a little bit later on this, uh, on this thing. If you would go to the next uh, slide. Um, you want the first takeaway on the common agricultural policy from our presentation should be that there is a continuum of the CAP, but there are also breaks in the nature of CAP reforms. 
And what the farm to fork is doing is placing this process that already started in 2018 in the broader framework of the Green Deal and in a better link with other type of uh, priorities. So we don't change the overall gradual orientation of the cap that passed through various stages, first to become more market oriented, second, um, much more open uh, to trade, and third, to strengthen uh, the income uh, support of farmers via decoupled support. Now what, what we want to do is strengthen the link with all the actors in the food chain and increase the overall level of ambition on environment. So here is where uh, I go into um, the next uh, uh, slide, please, if you want in an attempt uh, to speak, uh, if you want, oops. I was supposed to speak American English on supply and demand, but somehow this is not exactly what I, I sent. Obviously, wait, 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 uh, uh, Morgan. Um, yes, go to the next one. Well, you all have seen supply and demand curve, so normally the prices should be a vertical one. What is important, uh, well, at some point, this is going to be improved. It's a little bit embarrassing that this is taped, but what you can do. I, I mean, what we want to do and what we're looking for in terms of policy is that this interaction of supply and demand should arrive at some price that more or less would reflect what we expect with the interaction of uh, forces at the global level, whether it's a macroeconomy and trade. This is, if you want, the two parts of the farm to fork. It's the part that identifies how supply and demand will be linked at the end of the day. But before we do that, next is comes the various demand shifts that to a very large extent determine the fork part of the strategy. And what we have in demands is not just a relationship between prices and quantities. Above all, we have a relationship that reflects tastes and preferences. And tastes and preferences around food are also determined by cultural characteristics. And that's, if you want, one of the most difficult parts to analyze in terms of the potential impact of uh, the farm to fork strategy. Because you do different things if you focus on increasing, by the way, it's the area of organic uh, production that has to go towards 25%, uh, which is uh, more, uh, more than double of what we have today. You do completely different things if you exploit the very strong growth in the demands in the organic sector and change also consumer behavior with the various uh, measures. And a different impact is going to be there if this demand reaches some uh, limits and cannot grow further. So to a very large extent, changes on demand around foods should not be seen in a very different context of the changes in other basic uh, human needs, whether these apply to energy, to transport, to housing, if you want even to clothing. There is a series of changes that we have to do in our day-to-day -day behavior that need to make uh, our practices more sustainable. On the supply side next, this is where we do have a lot of opposing shifts. Most of the focus on this uh, from the level, new level playing field or the proposals we made uh, and the arguments you hear about the farmers are about shifts that actually push the supply curve to the left by increasing the cost of production, because after all, that's what the supply curve is. It's a, it's a curve that is driven by marginal cost of production. And what we tend to forget is that there is a very significant positive impact in the reduction of costs that is coming exactly from new technologies. And it is the interaction of these two very conflicting trends that will determine the farm part. And this is where the cap has the possibility to have a much stronger impact. And it has the possibility to have a much stronger impact because it is a policy that focuses to a very large extent on land management because the payments that are provided to farmers are conditional on best practices. So next, please, what the challenge that we face is that we have to respond to the need to produce more food with lower costs and as one colleague just mentioned earlier today, I have to clarify when, when we mean lower costs, we need to take into account the fact that the current costs do not 
reflect accurately externality. So this lower cost of production should take into account the need to reflect these uh, externalities. And we have to address this issue at the global level because you do very different things if the only thing you want to do is focus on the 5% of the world population that is living in the European Union. And you have to do something completely different if the global picture is taken into account. And we are pretty much aware of this. So next, there is a significant issue here when we want to use uh, new technologies. I like to call it mind the gaps. There is a knowledge gap. There is a gap on applications of these technologies. And there are gaps in the perception about uh, these technologies. Not everybody is using uh, these advanced technologies in the same way. And not everybody is open in doing that. And even when they're open in using them, what type of digital tools are you going to use if, for example, you don't have fast internet connection in rural areas? So there are a series of issues here that are important. So if we go to the next slide, uh, the second uh, takeaway is on best practices. And what is important to keep in mind here is that there is no monopoly of best practices when it comes to sustainability. And we do not claim to prioritize one or over the other. There is a rather healthy competition among them when they are assessed on the basis on their capacity, of their capacity to increase the economic and the environmental efficiency simultaneously, jointly if you want. And how this can be done? It can be done when we measure the results, rather the claims of what matters. And in the overall orientation of the common agricultural policy, in the overall orientation of the farm to fork, the focus is on increasing the overall level of ambition in all lands. There is a big discussion on whether we go to 20 or 25% of area in organic production. Wherever, we go and whatever the outcome, what happens to the rest of land is also extremely important. Every hectare of land has to come up with a higher level of ambition, no matter which practice applies to them. And the third and last uh, takeaway, if you want, is the role of science in accelerating the ongoing transition. And I stress the fact that there is an ongoing transition in European agriculture. And what we have tried to do with our proposals is provide a greater focus on strategic planning, on performance, and knowledge-based agricultural practices, and a strong research focus on soil. There is a soil mission in the new research project of the European Union that focuses in, uh, exactly on improving uh, soil health. And the aim is to accelerate this ongoing digital and uh, green uh, transition on European agriculture. And I've noticed uh, the concerns that Alan introduced on innovation, GMOs and the level playing field. But here, I mean, these are issues that are not new and they're not going to go, uh, go away magically. But what is important is to be able to grasp the opportunity of the COVID crisis in one particular area and better communicate the impact of science. Because you don't only have debates in Europe about the role of science. The, the role of vaccines and the reaction and rejection of vaccines in a significant part of population in our societies, which was not the case when, I mean, 20 or 30 years ago, is indicative of the fact that when it comes to science, we do have criticisms that we have to address. And I would use also the case of vaccines to indicate that what vaccines are also showing right now is a means to get out of the crisis that we currently face or with concrete practices that apply to human health. And we would like to have a debate that will also look and focus on this type of issues when they come to animal and plant health. And we're pretty much open to this debate and to use this opportunity to have this debate. And with that, I stop here. I'm pretty sure I raised more questions than I answered, but I'll be glad to join the debate afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tassos, and, you, and you're right. I've, I've got a few questions already that I look forward to asking when we get into the discussion. But first, we're going to welcome Marta Mesa, who is the director of Slow Food Europe. Uh, Marta has worked on slow food initiatives all around the world and since 2014 has been in Brussels. She focuses on coordinating European slow food initiatives with slow food initiatives internationally and also coordinating slow food initiatives within the European Union. Marta. 
Thank you, Bill, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, just uh, a couple of words on slow food for those of you who don't know it. Um, we're a global movement um, born about 30 years ago in a small town in northern Italy and now active in over 160 countries worldwide. And we're really a movement of communities that um, work to ensure that everybody can have access to food that is good for those for themselves, good for those who grow it and good for the planet. Now, uh, we have been working quite a, a bit on the farm to fork strategy and I'm glad to get to have a say today and to contribute to the debate. And the first thing I have to say is that um, Slow Food together with many other civil society organization, uh, organizations has really warmly welcomed this strategy. It's uh, a right step in the right direction to really move towards the transition towards sustainable food systems. So. Um, before we go in the different points I wanted to make, um, I, and I know there will be a presentation afterwards by the other speakers about the study carried out by the United States Department of Agriculture, but what I wanted to do today is basically um, look at um, what would be the implications of not taking action because of concerns that there are with the farm to fork strategy. And, um, in the study that will be presented afterwards, so bear with me, I'm not making justice to the study you'll present, but it's just for the sake of getting the conversation started. Um, the study finds out that uh, if we go ahead with the farm to fork strategy as it is, there would be a decline in agricultural production in the EU, there would be price increases that impact consumers' budgets, there would be a reduction in trade with negative impacts concentrated in regions with the world's most food and secure populations, and significant increases in food insecurity. Now, the study also says that it does not consider a number of aspects of the European Commission proposal, like uh, reductions in food waste. And it also says that the results, and here I'm quoting, do not provide any information about the potential benefits and costs to the environment and human health. So what I want to do to contribute to the debate today is to look at the relevance of the farm to fork strategy precisely to help us tackle some of these environmental and social costs that we're seeing nowadays. I'm not pretending to have data that um, contribute to an impact assessment by far, and we know that there are discussions going on about that, but there are data we already know about the cost of inaction and um, specifically looking again at the environmental and social costs. Um, and and those data demonstrate that business as, as usual is no longer an option and that if we want to make a leap beyond the current crisis, so I'm not talking about going back to normal, but moving forward and beyond, then we should look to diversified agroecological food systems. That's a position of slow food and of many other a large uh, coalition of civil society organizations. Now, why is business as, as usual no longer an option? I want actually to start this piece of the of my presentation by saying actually thinking as usual is no longer an option. And here I would like to challenge one of the basic premises of many of the conversations around food and farming, which is that we need to increase food production. That is a, an assumption that needs to be challenged, um, especially if we look at data like the amount of food waste that is happening at the global level. So we do know that one third of all food produced for human consumption is wasted globally every year. Um, it's uh, clear if we look at the data about the concentration of power in the hands of a few actors, whether it comes to seeds, um, but also that it comes to the concentration of land owned. We see that in Europe, but we also see that elsewhere. So what our position is that we do not need any to increase food production, increase yields per hectare. Rather, we need to ensure that local food systems can develop and thrive and that the access to basic resources like water, seeds and land and credit are democratically distributed and not in the hands of a few actors. Now, having said that, business as usual and thinking as usual is not an option. Um, and we do know that we are at a tipping point and this COVID-19 pandemic has clearly, starkly highlighted that there's a st strong mutual dependence of the planet's health and our own, and our own health. So, and we do know that the climate emergency, together with biodiversity loss and water and soil degradation, is threatening human survival. 
And over the next quarter century, it stands to undermine the food security of half the world's population. Now, what's the connection with climate change and food and farming? We do know, and th these are data from the IMF, as well as from the International Panel on Climate Change, that the agri-food sector now creates a quarter of human produced greenhouse gas emissions. And this is a, a share that is expected to increase to half of all such emissions by 2050, while another 8% of emissions result from non-food agriculture and deforestation. So agriculture has an important role to play in climate change and in tackling climate change. If we also want to uh, tackle food insecurity and hence measures to tackle climate change through food are highly welcome. If we look at another example of the environmental costs of non-action, and if we look at collapsing biodiversity, um, the loss of biodiversity, uh, which is in part also driven by, by pesticides and nitrogen-based fertilizers, um, the loss of biodiversity is jeopardizing a range of environmental services, including the pollination of many food crops, and these threatens future yields and costs some of 3% of global GDP each year. And it's also worth no noting that a quarter, a quarter of our planet's biodiversity is under our feet is in the soil. Tassa Zanotis, you mentioned the, the work that the Commission, uh, the European Commission is carrying out in soil. And we do have major issues with um, uh, soil erosion in, in Europe that is causing uh, an estimated loss of agricultural production that amounts to about 1.25 billion per year, billion euros. And uh, in 2020, a first global report on soils warned that one third of agricultural soils are so eroded as to risk sterility. And that would mean that after 12,000 years of harvest, we have 100 years more left. Now, this is a data that concerns any of us, whichever kind of farming we are doing or promoting. With no soil, it's really hard to produce food for, for anyone. So, and last on social costs. Um, I'm gonna take an example here. It's by far non exhaustive, but it's just for the sake of highlighting the, the, the cost of inaction. And at the moment, and also I'm taking this example because one of the clear targets in the farm to fork strategy is the reduction in the use of pesticides. And indeed, uh, uh, the study that will be presented afterwards also is mentioning, you know, like if the EU goes ahead with this, how is this gonna impact the rest of the, the world essentially? And if we look at pesticides that then there are there is robust evidence uh, that acute pesticide poisoning is an ongoing major global public health challenge. And as early as the 1990s, the WHO estimated that about 1 million unintentional pesticides poisonings uh, occur annually, leading to, they were estimating 20,000 deaths. Now, and these acute poisonings clearly have an impact that in the worst case scenario, um, results in casualties, but it also impacts on the quality of life, on the loss of well-being and the loss of ability to work. So again, if the EU is having an impact by reducing pesticides on the environment, but also on the quality of life, then um, what I want to show by mentioning these examples and these evidence is that we do actually need to take action on, this, on these issues and it is urgent and uh, there is no more time to lose. Now, if we look, look at the second point I wanted to make, given this data, and if we want to discuss about taking a leap beyond the crisis, and um, Alan Hardaker mentioned in the beginning, you know, like there's still, we could be going in one direction or another. And this is also where uh, in Europe, civil society is really uh, keeping an eye, so to say, or contributing to the policy debate by really um, insisting on the relevance of adopting uh, diversified, promoting a diversified agroecological food systems. So um, there is a study that was just recently published. Um, it's called the Long Food Movement, and it was written by the International Panel of Experts on the Sustainability of Food Systems. And they look at different scenarios. And in the high tech scenario, um, which is all about digital data, and in a DNA, the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, the use of robots, drones, and satellites, um, these would actually have a negative impact 
in terms of how many farmers would abandon their farms. This is already a very serious issue in Europe. We have lost many farmers in the last uh, 10, 20 years. Um, it would actually also uh, imply dismantling diversified food webs that currently sustain 70% of the world population. And it's really, and that's again where the thinking is usual or rather the challenge to the thinking comes. It's really about where do we put decisions about the developments of the food systems in the hands of a few companies that as things are now are controlling these technologies or are we opening the food system, democratizing it if you want and putting the, the, the fate of local food systems in the hands of local communities. Now, let me clarify, we are not against science, we are not against technology or innovation. Here is really who is this serving and any technology and innovation that serves communities is can can uh, help us make great strides, strides forward, but it needs to be accessible and democratic. And in the other scenario that uh, the long food movement study looks at, um, and it's looking indeed at having diversified agroecological food systems, um, they're basically the study saying if we manage to redirect flows, so incentive funding and so on, towards agroecological practices, then the combined combined annual impact uh, would be no less than 4.1 trillion US dollars. This is what the study estimates. So I, I gave you some figures just to say that there is evidence out there that um, these practices can contribute to the economic social, environmental and cultural sustainability of our food systems. And this is something that it is also being promoted by the FAO at large, by the UN um, and by, by other experts. So just to summarize, um, again, the farm to fork is definitely an important stepping stone. It's going in the right direction. We need to move swiftly. And we believe that moving towards diversified agroecological food systems is the key to achieve sustainability at all levels, including economic, but not only. And you know, one thing to also think about is, you know, in the financial sector, diversification is key to manage risks. Why should we not, in our food systems, diversify risk by going towards food systems that are anchored in local food biodiversity, in knowledge that has been developed over centuries of farming the, la the land day in, day out, that are anchored in relationships, direct relationships between uh, farmers and citizens. And um, we as Low Food, as a movement that has been working also to promote food biodiversity in the last 30 years, we have an anecdotal evidence that where you have agroecological food systems, farmers, fishers, food artisans, and the surrounding communities thrive, and so does the environment, and so does the economy. Um, but luckily there is more evidence coming to support our anecdotal uh, evidence. And also, um, it, again, the data about the current situation are clear. If we fail, unlike in the financial crisis, there will be no lender of last resort and more, more, important, more importantly, there will be no planet B. So thank you. Thank you, Marta. Uh, yes, we have. I mean, the questions are, are coming in rapidly and we appreciate that and we look forward to getting to them soon. But before, let's talk a little bit about data. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about different data and there is some studies out there which will give us some indication of where farm to fork might be headed. And to have that discussion, we have two very senior economists who have worked in this field over the last several months and will be able to present some of their work. The first is Jason Beckman, who's a senior economist at the Economic Research Service at USDA. His career is focused on international trade, production, and environmental economics. He counsels policymakers on the economic impact and the ramifications of different policy initiatives and programs. So Jason, can you provide a little bit of clarity to all the discussion that's gone before you? Sure, and thanks to the Farm Foundation for having us. Um, so as Bill mentioned, uh, you'll hear from two of us who worked on this report that was published last November. So it's going to be a tag team effort. I'll uh, talk about the results from the study, and then Maros will talk about what we've been doing since then. Next. 
so uh, basically, uh, you know, you've heard a lot about the EU Green Deal. Uh, they state it's their plan to make the EU's economy sustainable. Um, uh, these under the Green Deal, there are many what they call strategies. Uh, our work um, looks at mainly the farm to fork, and there's a little bit about uh, land and how it's used in the biodiversity strategies. So these were released last May, um, and as several people have mentioned, there hasn't been any um, studies to date uh, except for ours. So within the uh, farm to fork uh, strategies, uh, they really focus on sustainability and they note there are four areas of improvement. Um, our work uh, looks at the first, sustainable food production. And we're gonna ask specifically how does changing agricultural inputs affect food production and security? Next slide, please. So uh, as Alan mentioned, there are many, many things that the EU proposes to do within the farm to fork strategies. Uh, some of these are more straightforward to understand uh, what they want to change. They're more readily available to model in our economic models. And these are those listed on the uh, left-hand portion of the slide. And they're what we consider in this work. And those are a reduction in pesticide use by 50%, fertilizers by 20%, land and agriculture by 10%, and a reduction in antimicrobials in livestock by 50%. Uh, so we are gonna look at three scenarios. The first is what happens if the EU is the only region that adopts these input reductions. A second says, well, what happens if some other countries who uh, uh, depend on shipping agricultural products to the EU also join? And the third is what happens if everyone in the world were to adopt these input reductions. So again, as Alan mentioned, I'm glad he went first. Uh, there are many, many things uh, within the farm to fork. Uh, we couldn't possibly uh, model them all or um, understand exactly how things might change. Uh, so I just list some of these that our analysis excludes. And they include some market factors such as labeling and animal welfare. And it's been mentioned, uh, the increase in organic production. Um, we don't consider that in the study. Um, in addition, uh, we do not estimate any sort of environmental impacts, which could be potential costs such as compliance or maybe having to uh, till the soil more um, or potential benefits such as uh, less erosion or more honey booms. In addition, we don't consider any sort of productivity changes in the study that we published in November, uh, but Marlos will talk about uh, that in his presentation. So um, back to this middle scenario. Um, so I, again, as Alan mentioned, uh, the EU wants to have sort of this level playing field. Um, in fact, they state uh, and their website for these farm to fork uh, mentioned that they will support the global transition to sustainable agri-food systems through its trade policies and international cooperation instruments. Okay. So what we do is we think of a purely hypothetical situation where the EU says basically that they're not going to import as much products from countries that are still using these uh, products that they uh, want to reduce, pesticides and fertilizers. And this sort of goes along the similar vein with non-tariff measures. So the EU, along with a lot of other countries such as the US, they tend to ban products that are produced with different technologies such as uh, beef, pork and poultry produced in the US. Um, so for this study, we're gonna, for this scenario, we're gonna say, what happens if the EU says that level playing field is in place? Uh, we're only going to allow imports from products that countries the, from countries that also adopt the input reductions. So, um, for the study that we did in November, uh, we assume uh, some countries join, um, and those countries are basically the uh, other European trade partners, such as the. Uh, 
EFTA partners, other countries that want to join the European Union, the Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, now, we don't completely shut off trade. Again, purely hypothetical scenario. And we say, well, the EU is only going to uh, reduce imports from, those from countries that do not adopt the scenario by uh, 50%. Next slide. Uh, so to look at the economic impacts from this work, we're going to use a global economic model called GTAP. Uh, GTAP is used worldwide and it's used for this sort of study. Uh, you can see that it's used by many agencies within the US government. It's used by the World Bank, uh, IFPRI, it's used by the European Commission. Um, and in addition, so you'll notice that some of the market impacts we estimate are quite big. So in addition to this GTAP model, we also uh, supplement our work with this uh, international food security assessment model that we have at ERS that uh, allows us to estimate the impacts to food security for the 76 poorest countries in the world. Excellent. So uh, let's talk about what our model estimates. So in the first scenario, the EU is the only region that adopts the farm to fork strategies. You'll basically see that by reducing inputs into production, uh, production is going to fall. And the model indicates that production would decrease by 12%. Uh, given that there's less product available on the market, prices go up. Uh, in this case, the model says 17%. Uh, the EU is a major player in international markets. Uh, as such, their exports fall um, by 20% in this case, and they have to import more. So our model also uh, estimates the impacts to farm income, and this is purely based on changes in production and changes in prices. And the model indicates that um, if the EU were to implement these input reductions that we specified, farm income could decrease by 16%. The model also calculates uh, changes in food costs. So this is per person per year, and the results indicate that food costs could increase by $153. In addition, uh, EU GDP is estimated to decrease by $71 billion. So for the US and all other countries in the world, Results are very similar. Uh, there's a slight increase in production, about four tenths of a percent as the US tries to uh, make up for the loss in EU production. Um, given that uh, the US is exporting more, basically to the EU, prices go up, again, because of competition for less products. Uh, we estimate that food cost would increase in the US, but it's about a third of what it is for or the EU and GDP decreases uh, by $2 billion. So for the world, uh, the model indicates that there'd be a loss in agricultural production of 1%, which is basically the share of the EU in the global market. Prices increase, uh, as we saw, because there's less products available. Uh, trade decreases, so although other countries try to fill the loss in EU trade markets. Uh, the EU reducing their exports basically leads to a loss in global agricultural trade. Uh, the thing I'll point out here is we have an estimate for food insecurity, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, so again, this is for the 76 poorest countries in the world. And, the, and that model indicates that food insecurity would increase by 22 million people if the EU adopted these strategies. And you can see that uh, the loss in global GDP of 94 billion is predominantly made up from the EU. Next slide. Okay, so this is that scenario where the EU and some of its closest uh, trading, well, and some uh, trade partners who depend on the EU for their agricultural markets uh, I'd also adopt the strategies. So you can see uh, similar impacts, the magnitudes are a little bit bigger in this case, especially with prices. So you can see that prices in the EU increased by 
And this is largely because this scenario is basically creating two trading blocks within the world, those who adopt the farm to fork strategies and those who do not. So you have the US, Brazil, Canada, China, who do not adopt the strategies, they still trade with each other. But the EU is not allowing as much imports of those products and their prices really increased. Um, so you can see also in this instance, the food cost in the EU uh, per person per year is $651 and GDP increases, uh, GDP decreases by $186 billion. So for the US and other countries who do not adopt the strategies, the results are again quite similar. Uh, production prices change by a little bit. Uh, trade falls this time. So the loss of the EU markets uh, uh, leads to a decrease in US exports, um, but there's a slight change in US GDP. Uh, for the world, um, the results are largely dependent on those adopting the strategies. Uh, production decreases by 4%, prices increase by 21%, uh, trade falls by 9%. Um, and in this case, uh, the number uh, food insecure people increases uh, by 103 million people. And you can see this time the decrease in global GDP of 381 billion. Uh, a good amount is from the EU, but it's still um, a little bit less than half. Uh, and, the, and it's because you're getting a lot of decrease in GDP from countries who are also adopting the strategies. Next slide. So for our final scenario, you can see basically results are similar across the board because everyone is adopting the strategies. For the EU and the US, again, and the world, the decrease in production, double digit increases in prices, uh, trade falls by 4%. Uh, in this instance, uh, food costs are more than $500 per person per year for both the US and EU. They both have big losses in GDP. And you'll note that uh, for the world, the uh, increase in food insecurity is 185 million people and the loss in GDP is $1.1 trillion. Next slide. So we can break these results down by commodity and these are global results. So you can see a similar pattern. Uh, you can see a pattern uh, emerging. Um, so in that EU only scenario, when the EU is the only region adopting those input strategies, uh, production decreases by about one to 3% uh, by commodity. And as you add more countries adopting the uh, input reductions, you get bigger decreases in agricultural production. So you can see that um, uh, in the case of, for example, sugar crops, if all regions in the world were to adopt the input reductions, the model estimates a decrease of 22%. Next slide. Um, and a similar pattern emerges for prices. So again, in the EU only scenario, prices increase by about five to 10% by commodity, bigger impacts as more people join the strategies. And by the time you have everyone adopting the strategies, you have um, more than 100% increase in all crops. And you'll notice that um, the crops are impacted the most. And this is because they have a large share of their input costs going to land, pesticides, and fertilizers, which is what we're reducing in our model. And you can see that the results um, for products that are further down the supply chain are also impacted, but the price change is a little bit smaller than what they are for crops. Next slide. Okay, so um, the final set of results, we'll talk a little bit more about the food insecurity uh, results a little bit more. Um, so you can see in that EU only scenario, uh, the impacts on food insecurity are largely in other Asia and Africa. And in that middle scenario, you can see that uh, almost all the results are attributable to Africa. And this is because we assume that Africa joins the farm to fork uh, input reduction strategies. 
um, while other Asia does not. Um, and finally, in that global uh, scenario where 185 million people are estimated uh, to be more food insecure, you can see again, other Asia and Africa have the biggest impact and then India is also has a large increase in number of food insecure people. Next slide. Uh, so Tassos went over this a little bit, um, but I will uh, talk about a little bit more. Um, so are our results plausible? So are these input reductions that we're putting in our model, should they lead to the changes that we estimate? And it's quite easy to see why this happens. Um, so back to Econ 101, if you have prices on the vertical axis, quantity going left to right, demand is downward sloping. As prices decrease, consumers want more. Supply is upward sloping, prices increase, suppliers are willing to supply more. Now, there are a couple of things that shift the supply and demand curve. For example, if you were to have an increase in population, you would shift the demand curve to the right because you have more people consuming products. So in our instance, uh, we have a decrease in products that are available to producers, and this basically increases their input costs. So less products available, you have more demand for products, and this uh, leads to that increase in input costs, which from econ theory shifts the supply curve to the left. So we go from that supply zero to supply new, and what happens is our equilibrium, whereas before prices were at P0, Q0, we are now moving to the higher prices and less quantity. Next slide. Okay. So um, the final point I'll make is um, since we released the study back in November, there has been some response from EU media and economists. Um, so just last month, uh, EU Agricultural Commissioner said, yes, these market impacts are expected. In particular, farmers could expect yields to decrease and farm income to decrease, uh, but there are several benefits to adopting um, farm to fork strategies, uh, but um, that uh, hasn't been borne out and, um, and we presume will come from whenever the European Commission re releases their study. Um, in addition, we've been uh, told that uh, consumer diet preferences are changing, that there's more vegetarians. Um, and someone offered the suggestion that higher food prices are good because people will eat less and they'll be healthier. Um, so in addition, uh, the last two points are what we've been working on since November. And they, one of them are said that pro our productivity growth projections are gloomy. So we do not have any productivity change in our input reduction results that I showed you. And we agree. Um, so we agree that uh, uh, productivity could um, possibly uh, change some of the market impacts. And Maros will uh, talk about uh, those results uh, in a little bit. And uh, it's been offered that the trade restrictions are unlikely, that the EU doesn't impose um, these sort of non-tariff measures on other countries. Um, we take the view that, you know, back in November, we assumed certain countries would join and Maros will present results that allows the model to estimate who would join um, the farm to fork strategies. Uh, finally, um, as Marta mentioned, um, possibly the key to all of this is the environmental impacts. Uh, I mentioned we do not consider any of those, um, but you know, given that the market impacts could be expected, uh, it's likely that the environmental um, portion of implementing the farm to fork could be the key to uh, the strategies uh, being accepted by farmers. Great, thank you, Jason. And let's let Maros continue this conversation. We have Maros Ivanik, who is an agricultural economist with the Market and Trade Economics Division of USDA Economic Research Service. 
He's previously worked with the International Finance Corporation and with the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, both members of the World Bank Group, and has spent a career analyzing global agricultural production and poverty. Maros. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, so as Jason already mentioned, I will be talking about uh, what we have been doing ever since we published this report. Specifically, I will be talking about some of the considerations for adoption uh, of these strategies, given that as Jason has presented, it is likely based on our model that adopting these strategies would lead to very severe market impacts in terms of prices. So what I will specifically be talking about is two paths that we consider as a possible way for making these strategies workable and adopted by additional countries. Can I have the next slide, please? And I forgot to mention this again is teamwork, which includes not only Jason Beckman, who has just spoken, but also Jeremy Jellif, also our colleague at uh, MTED ERS. So as we have seen in Jason's presentation, we expect that if all of these reductions in inputs are put into place, then we would see significant reductions in production, which leads to increases in prices, affects agricultural global trade, depending on which block you may be in, if you're a country which adopts or a country which does not adopt. So the question that we are asking specifically here is, what would, like, what would a buy-in for this for these strategies look like. And we're considering two very specific methods that these strategies could be made workable or adopted by additional countries. In our model, of course, we do not make any assumptions about what countries may want to do politically. Of course, we're just looking at the model and what is the model telling us. The first one is research and development through investment. So perhaps productivity growth, which we ignored in our initial study in the, the, the report that Jason just um, walked us through, we did not assume any change in productivity in agriculture. However, perhaps with some additional growth and investment into productivity, into research and development, things could change. And the second aspect that we are looking at is what about other countries outside, outside of the EU? Is there any way through trade policy that the EU could make this a better uh, state of the world for the countries, which means that the countries might decide that given that the EU could restrict their access to their market, perhaps it would be welfare increasing better for them to actually go ahead with adopting these strategies. Of course, this is extremely hypothetical and just uh, uh, driven by our, our model. Can I have the next slide, please? So let's first talk about farm to fork and productivity growth. This is nothing new. This is actually something that was already published by the European Commission. It was clearly on their mind that there would be some productivity growth accompanying the adoption of those strategies. The question is, given what we have seen so far in Europe, in the world, in other countries, how uh, productivity has grown historically, do we have enough time to actually um, increase productivity in agriculture to make sufficient improvements to make these market impacts um, less severe or actually be completely neutralized. Can have the next slide, slide, please? So to do that, we just looked at the historical TFP improvements since 1980 through 2016. This is the last year for which we have data. As you can see, uh, globally, we observed uh, really impressive increase in productivity since 1980, about 60%. The blue, line, which is the orange line, the blue line shows you what was the productivity gain within Europe. And then the US is the gray line, which you can see is a slightly uh, greater uh, or productivity has grown historically with an exception of a few periods more than elsewhere in the world. And of course, Europe has uh, also shown that in that period, of about uh, 36 years productivity increase by about 60%. So what does that mean for farm to fork? Can I have the next slide, please? So to address that question, we were just making a very simple experiment. We took our model and we asked that model by rerunning it. Okay, we, we know that if we take all these inputs out, we get all these market impacts. What if we tell the model to keep the prices stable and then adjust the productivity 
so to in, in, in order to tell us inform us how much productivity is needed to offset these negative market impacts so we ran that and we of course observe, observed different productivity growths needed by commodity by crops in order to offset these farm to fork strategies negative impact so for example in the first column you can see that for paddy rice we would need an 18 percent increase in productivity and if we do that then the price impact would actually be neutralized would be zero for other crops it's much higher so that would be 36.6 percent for wheat 46 percent for coarse grains and you can see for fruits and vegetables actually uh lower at nine uh nine percent so this is what we need to hit as a target in our model in order to make the farm to fork uh, neutral in terms of market impacts. Now let's look at back, let's look at the historical um, trends. Given what we have seen, how many years would it take, given that uh, growth and productivity that you saw in a slide before, how long would it take to reach those targets in Europe? So if we just consider the historical precedent, we really don't, do not know how much investment and potentially additional improvements in productivity might happen. If you only consider what has happened so far, you would need 13 years of previous historical progress in TFP growth to hit those targets for paddy rice. For others, such as wheat would be 24 years, for coarse grains, 27 years. Only for two commodities, which is fruits and vegetables and livestock, you would only need nine years, which is less than the time frame for, for which the adoption of farm to fork is envisioned. So what this is telling us that unless things change in terms of productivity growth in Europe, it would not be likely if we base if we base our assumption of future on history, it would not be enough time to completely offset the negative impacts of this of these strategies um, on, on the European Union. Next slide, please. The second question that we are answering here in our work is, um, let's just forget about productivity and let's see if there is a path through trade, through trade policy to make uh, these strategies um, a better deal for other countries so that they might want to join. And we're not making any determination based on politics. This is strictly based on our model. And I will speak in a moment about what we specified in our model to be the objective for each country. Next slide, please. So this is what Jason presented earlier, which is the middle scenario. This was an exogenous determination which came uh, from uh, our colleagues from FAS. And um, in orange, you can see the countries which uh, we expected or assumed that they would uh, join farm to fork strategies based on their high level of agricultural exports into the European Union. That's what uh, we called middle scenario in uh, the work that Jason presented. Next slide, please. So what we wanted to do here was do something different. Rather than decide from our desks, so, you know, like based on some assumptions, um, which countries would join, what we, what, what we did was we um, specified an objective function for each country. Um, and based on whether, um, the country would benefit more by adopting the strategies or facing uh, or the country would be facing a restriction to the EU market, they would decide whether or not to join. So very specifically, there's only one inequality in my slide. A country would be deciding between the economy with the farm to fork strategies adopted, which means that there will be some reductions in inputs and impacts on GDP. And the, the other option would be not to join the strategies and then they would be faced with restrictions in accessing uh, the European Union market and the market of other countries that join. And that would be identical to what Jason presented. There would be a 50% reduction in imports through non-tariff barriers. So what we then did was we asked the model, it had to be run several times in several iterations for each country to make its own decision. So a country might, uh, evaluate is it better for me to join or is it uh, is the welfare increasing if I if we do not join and based on that the country would make a determination however if another country joins that might dilute the benefits of uh, uh, an exclusive access to the EU market so the first country that joins would of course get exclusive access to the EU market and as more countries start joining it is possible that 
with the group being so much larger, it would just not make sense for the country to stay in the block. So we allow in our model to, um, we run it, in, run it in several iterations for each country to make a determination based on how other countries have decided. So in a way we are, we found a Nash equilibrium for farm to fork adoption. We identified a set of countries for which it would not, would not make sense to make any more changes. What we found was that uh, our initial guess or the assumption that mainly the African countries and the countries in the European Free Trade Agreement would join was only partly correct. We, we, what our model is telling us that some of those countries which we thought might join like Egypt, Morocco and Switzerland would actually decide based on our model to stay out. Next slide, please. This is the final map of our simulations where uh, we are presenting in orange those countries which would finally decide to stay uh, within the bloc with the European Union by adopting the farm to fork strategies. In addition to those, and you can see they include countries like Argentina, Chile, New Zealand and Australia and some African countries. We're also showing in yellow those countries which would join if nobody else joins. So for example, Canada in our model would actually decide to adopt the farm to fork strategies in exchange for exclusive access to the European Union market. However, as other countries start joining, the value of that uh, access to the market of the European Union and, and other countries diminishes and Canada would opt out at some point in our simulation. Next slide, please. Here's a comparison, a quick comparison of our endogenous scenario on the right with the middle scenario that Jason just walked us through. The top part of the table is just telling you um, how different is our scenario, the final endogenous determined, endogenously determined set of countries which our model would predict would want to join farm to fork. How is it different from what we assumed in our report? As you can see, um, the set of countries that our model comes up with is actually smaller. So rather than 29%, representing 29% of global agricultural production, our model predicts 20% of the world agricultural production will be covered by farm to fork. And that would represent even smaller share of global population instead of 28%, 13% of the population. If you look at the impacts, market impacts, however, you would notice that even though we have scaled down the size of the farm to fork group by about one third, the negative impacts are actually much smaller than um, just being scaled by one third. So for example, prices do not increase by 21% in our scenario, but only by 8%. The reduction in the, the production does not fall by 4%, but only by 2%. Uh, farm incomes are unchanged. Uh, food cost is much smaller. Instead of $159 per person per year, we predict in this scenario only $46 um, increase in food costs uh, expenditures by consumers per capita per year. And most importantly, the GDP impact is only about half of what we had before. Of course, this makes sense because our model allows countries to make the decision endogenously. Those countries where the adoption of farm to fork strategy strategies would lead to the worst market outcomes, these would not join. So what we are looking at is a, a set of countries with the mildest or, or, or least um, severe market impacts um, from adopting these strategies. Next slide, please. So just to sum up, we, we have already seen from our previous study that farm to fork input reductions are projected to decrease agricultural output and trade. It is based on historical precedent appears unlikely to be able to offset farm to fork impacts, the negative market impacts uh, within the time frame that the European Commission has indicated um, for, for the adoption of those strategies. Based on the historical trends, it just seems that there's not enough time. So something would have to change there. However, if the EU were able to impose trade, trade restrictions, and of course we have no idea what these trade, trade restrictions would look like, but um, if they could restrict um, imports from the countries which do not join the European Union in farm to fork by about 50% as we have simulated, then this could actually make farm to fork globally viable. There will be countries which actually would find that it's improving their welfare if rather than staying out and losing access to the market, your EU market and the market of other adopters, they actually are better off if they just go ahead with the strategies and, and uh, um, experience the welfare losses. The loss is actually smaller for those countries if they actually do that and uh, maintain the access to the European Union market. 
uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the to the questions. Great. Thank you, Maros. And thank you to all of our panelists. We have lots of questions. And what I've been trying to do is combine them into a few so that we can get to as many different subjects as possible. Um, so let me throw this off. And I'm going to throw the first questions to um, Marta and Tassos. But any of you can join in if you want to uh, add your own comments. But um, Jason and, and Maros have shown us in their analysis that agricultural production will go down. I guess the first question to Tassos is that consistent with what the European Commission's pending study is going to show? Um, is uh, production likely to go down based on European estimates? And then, and then to Marta, you said that uh, you, you challenged the idea of whether we even need to increase food production and that re by reducing waste, we might be able to get by without increasing food production. But then later in your presentation, you said that climate change is likely to undermine food security for as much as half the population. So if you have climate change undermining food security, can reducing waste uh, provide 2000 calories a day to over eight and a half billion people? So Tassos and Marta, can you comment on the ramifications of reduced production and how we might compensate for that? Thank you very much, Bill. Uh one of my presentations recently had the title uh, between uh, uh, a rock and a hard place. And that's where I find myself right now in here in this uh, discussion, because you see some of the results for the first time and you're squeezed to give an answer. In fact, I'm known to be one of those that have been pushing for years, and we have a record in my directorate for uh, transparency in terms of providing results of analysis. But I'm sorry to say, Jason, and. Uh, that, and, and Maros, that in the manner by which you made this presentation, assume that you were, and this is clearly going to go in the, the political debate right now about the future of the common agricultural policy. How do you interpret these results? Well, the first thing that you have to interpret is what are the assumptions on these results? And here, I need to stress one thing from the beginning. You start assuming that the way to successfully address the farm to fork, uh, uh, targets is to impose trade restrictions. Our starting point is completely different. It is by a combination of measures that change both consumer and producer behavior to make agriculture more sustainable. Clearly, if we do it alone, there is going to be a leakage, and we have said that publicly. Clearly, if there is no change on the fork side, there is going to be a serious problem on the farm side. And we have also said it uh, in public. And if you want, uh, the reason that the discussion and the, the GRC study, which is part of the climate impact assessment, is not out yet, had to do with the fact that it's not a farm to fork impact assessment, because that would require a much more global understanding, but just an uh, adaptation of uh, the scenario of the supply side of EU agriculture with all the question marks that exist in the other areas. And I would like to stress a couple of points here uh, about what you assume, because I think the manner by which you put the supply and demand curve and the manner by which I put it, despite the fact that one axis disappeared, shows a big difference. Concretely, we have brought in recent agricultural lateral conferences, examples of, first of all, agroecology and conservation agriculture, then precision farming, and then organic farming, all three practices indicate that you can increase economic efficiency and reduce the footprint simultaneously. So the real question is, how are we going to move the supply curve to the right with methods of production, that's productivity growth, that are more sustainable than today? And I repeat once more, this has to happen on all land, 100% of land. And this is where the leverage of the common agricultural policy is, because we provide payments that are linked to land, conditional on certain elements of land use, and the priority would be in the strategic plans of the member states to measure what member states are doing. Second point here there, the model that you are using, which we also use, we never use it alone. 
We never use GTAP alone. We use it with the Agling model of OECD and with the Capri model. Why? Because we need much more detail on what is happening at the member state level to be able to see what the impact of assumptions we make about uh, the member states, if you want the revealed preferences about the choices is going to be. And let me read you something which to a large extent explain why you come up with results like that. The commission on the, on the so-called fertilizer target, which is not a fertilizer, it's a nutrient balance target, says the commission will act to reduce nutrient losses by at least 50% while ensuring that there is no deterioration in soil fertility. How does the 20% of fertilizer use reduction come? Because we made a calculation at a very regional level of what is the nutrient surplus in certain areas, how much of this needs to be reduced, and whether we have possibilities, and we do have possibilities, in certain parts to even increase the fertilizer use. So it's not, the global figure comes with very different regional uh, implications. All of this, all of this and all the discussion about improving environmental performance without actually hurting economic efficiency is missed in your analysis. You, you said yeah. that you don't look into this. Also, let me inter interject. Um, so I'm a little confused. Is it the position of the European Union that this will not reduce agricultural output? No, there are going to be sectors that production is going to be reduced. The, the animal sector is a very clear example. And we have always said, I mean, in fact, even in previous reforms, we have had a reduction in the level of production in certain sectors. I still remember the 2003 reform, we said beef production is going down, go down by 3% we had then in the analysis, prices will go up by 7%. It went further down and prices went further up. We're not saying that there are going to be sectors where production shouldn't be reduced. But this has to be sector specific, and there are interlinkages between the various sectors that whose result cannot be assumed. If, for example, even the consumption, we put the share of what consumers are going to uh, do fixed. It is that's that's the. I mean, we we understand and clearly accept the complexity of under, underlying these you know, aspects, and this is why the stress that we make is that this is not an anti-technology uh, proposal. It's a growth strategy proposal that tries to do something that is very difficult, but also very necessary in all human needs. Take the discussion we have and put it in energy, put it in uh, transport and cars. We don't need to have a more efficient cars. We don't need to have more efficient energy. The same thing applies to food. We need to change dietary patterns to make them more healthy, not by imposing trade restrictions, but by actually changing the manner by which people see what they're doing. And we need actually to focus on, on uh, waste, which is not going to be a, a magical solution, but will also contribute. There is well, no- Marta, Marta, you talked about waste and you said that we, you challenged the assumption that we need to increase agricultural food production, but then you also said that because of climate change, there's going to be increasing food insecurity if we have reduced production in certain sectors in the European Union, and if you look at the USDA analysis and other countries that might adopt the EU program, is waste getting rid of waste going to be enough to provide 2,000 calories to eight and a half billion people? Reducing waste is one of the things to do. And again, it's we need to think outside of the box. We're right now thinking in a context where the condition is that is it, as it is now, so with Europe importing and exporting a great deal of food. Now, in from our point of view, and that is also widely um, shared with other many civil society organizations and researchers, the key to solving food insecurity is developing local food systems that are resilient to shocks, that are adapted to the local system, this, the solution is not growing oranges in South Africa to ship them to Europe in winter or growing green beans in Kenya to ship them when they're out of season here. This is not the trade that we're talking about. This is not the kind of food systems that we're talking about. And, you know, actually uh, food waste uh, impacts even more like it's one of the great contrib contributors to climate change. So if we want to tackle climate change, Food change needs to, food waste needs to be tackled, and and yes, it's not going to be clearly the only uh, thing we need to do to ensure food security. But we're really talking about something different here. 
Bill, if I might to clarify, I need to clarify mm -hmm. one point here. On the basis of the analysis that at least in DG Agrin with colleagues in the GRC who have done, at the global level, at the global level, we believe that we need to produce more with less, but more. There is a very serious issue of distribution around the world, and there, are, there is plenty of scope to improve, but our analysis is that globally, this, there is a need to do that. And that's why it is important to do it in, as a global strategy, is not only looking at what we're doing. I need to clarify that. Okay, thank you. And, th and this is a related question, and I'll, I'll toss it to you first, Tasso, but everybody jump in. There's a lot of questions about uh, organic farming and um, the fact that organic farming is going to move the supply curve to the right, which I think is, is something that you might have mentioned, Tassos. But is a shift to 20, 25% organic, is that based on any quantified advantage over conventional production? And can it really even do that? Can you reach, uh, achieve increased production with organic without putting a whole lot more land into production and actually increase the land dedicated to agricultural crops? No, let me make it clear. I never said that the organic production will shift the supply curve to, to the right. It's going to shift it to the left. What, but what I said is the share of area that will go to organic is one thing. And there is a very strong drive in the European Union to use organic production by consumers. So, I mean, it, it makes sense for farmers to do organic. The real challenge of organic is that we need to have increased the level of production and consumption in certain uh, member states that are going, uh, that are lagging behind. But what we also, I also said is, whether we arrive at the 25% target of area or the 20% target of area, the rest of the area, and that's the majority of the area, has the capacity to increase productivity by reducing actually the environmental footprint. And that's, that's why it's a global strategy. And that's why I said, there is no monopoly on best practices. And you, what matters is what you measure in the soil, what you measure in the air, what you measure in terms of gains in all these specific targets we have done. And clearly new technologies have to play a major role. And this is not an anti-tech strategy. On the contrary, we wouldn't have spent all this money in, uh, in the research project to focus on soil, and we wouldn't be talking about the digitalization uh, of agriculture and the need actually to bridge the gaps between those that use new technologies and those that are lagging behind. And that's one of the challenges of the structure of European agriculture, because in certain areas where you have smaller farmers, the cost of a, uh, entering into these uh, new technologies is significant for them. And that's why we have also stressed the need to improve the uh, performance of the farm advisory systems, what uh, in the US we, we call the extension services. Um, there are a few, many questions about the uh, reduction in use of pesticides and other agricultural crop protection products. And it's related to this whole conversation about shifting um, production to 20, 25% on organics. And if that's going to actually then shift the production, uh, the supply curve to the left, then it presumes if we're not going to have real significant reductions in supply, we're going to have to increase the production on the conventional properties. And, and the questions are, is, is it realistic to um, begin removing crop protection products if you're going to need to increase the productivity of conventional lands? And many people are suggesting that we're going to have a significant reduction and the crop protection products available just by 2025, how are you going to avoid significant reductions in productivity? And I'm, that's not just you, Tassos, I'm throwing that out to the whole group. My answer to that is you, you clearly need to, to be much more open in, in new uh, techniques that address issues that relate uh, to plant health. There's no escape in that. I mean, you can throw some away, but you need other ones. But for me, as an economist, the debate, uh, when I see it from outside, is not different from human health. We do have an excessive use of certain medicine. That doesn't mean that we need to do away with uh, medicine. It, 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 it means that we need to, to focus on the efficacy of the manner by which we use medicine and throw, or the same way that we throw some pharmaceuticals away and come up with new ones, we have to do the same thing in, in agriculture, when plant and animal health. And that would require a 
you know, to look at what science has to bring about. And also it would require a very clear understanding of where perceptions and uh, resistance to uh, science and new scientific technologies come from and how to address them. Oh, there's no escape from that in my view. That's so one kind of person is asking um, it, whether or not the, the commission has done any studies to identify sort of a, a breaking point where the reduction of crop protection products will actually begin resulting in a reduction of productivity. And, and you're suggesting that maybe it won't reduce productivity, but that's based on the idea that the commission is going to be open to new technologies. And, and many people are asking if the commission is, is not necessarily welcoming of new technologies, how do you get begin to move forward with increased productivity on conventional properties if you don't have new technologies and you don't have crop protection products? No, the only thing I have to offer here is a little bit uh, patient until the report on the commission on these new technologies is coming out. But there are many studies out there on these ones, but on, on specific cases, and we haven't uh, brought them all together, but that's what uh, our colleagues uh, have to do in uh, this is something when they come with a change in the pesticides. Uh, yeah, and, and Bill, can I just can I just add something there? There's please, a couple please. of things that are quite important. Um, just in terms of the, the the whole discussion here about this reduction of inputs and indeed the number of pesticides is going down. You know, the, the, the approved pesticide is going down year on year with, without farm to fork. Um, and, and the question is, and I I, I completely understand Tassos's commission perspective, but we really need to remember that the it's the politics of the parliament and the member states that is going to decide the final outcome here. And I suspect many of them don't share Tassos's views, his openness to technology, his openness to solutions. Um, and I think that, that for me is more of the problem. It's not what Tassos is saying with the intention as laid out. It's, it's what's going to happen in, in, in the next few years when this goes through the run of, of, of the two other institutions. And, and that, that is all of this conversation about if you're going to reduce inputs on the one hand, what are the alternative solutions that you're proposing for farmers? And at the moment, there are not good enough or fast enough pathways to get these things to market. Uh, and I think that's a little bit of a concern. If I can, can, yeah. Go ahead. Mark, go ahead. Thanks. Um, if I can just uh, connect to the last points being made, but I think again here, we really need to think out of the box. We're talking just about productivity and as it's been raised by some of the participants in the chat and in the question and answer section, the farm to fork was set up with the ambition of making Europe climate neutral. So there is clearly a strong environmental sustainability concept and goal. And we cannot just look at productivity in if you want the old fashioned way, which we look at productivity as the one indicator of success. We have been saying, and I'm glad Tassos that you mentioned it, like we need to look at the internal, internalization apologies of negative externalities. So, you know, what are we talking about here? Are we, are we talking about producing food that, you know, helps us meet a phase, the multiple crises that we're facing and really get beyond this crisis. And, and again, uh, I really want to challenge again the idea that we need to produce more. The question is, where do we need to produce more? Because also in Europe, we have such a high level of eye waste and uh, food waste, and we still have a lot of people who go to bed angry, hungry. Even in Europe, we have hunger. And so it's in the rest of the world. So the issue is, who, who has access to the resources and who has access to the food? So it's a much bigger question than just let's increase productivity for the sake of increasing productivity. And, and in terms of the technologies, again, I just want to emphasize technologies are great if they help us stride forward as long as they're democratic. It cannot be that they're in the hands of a few companies and institutions. Tassos, in a few different times, you've talked about this is going to be most successful if it's a, a global or international strategy as opposed to just the European Union. There's some concern that the European Union is going to be making it harder for its own farmers because it may not be welcoming of new technologies and yet at the same time it's remo um, removing crop protection tools and that unless there are increased subsidies that farmers will begin leaving the industry and that European production will go down just simply because there will not be as many players engaged in agricultural production in Europe. So one, is it anticipated that, that subsidies will be increased in order to keep farmers on the land? And two, uh, if this is only going to work, if we have it be international, 
Is it the intent that the European Union is going to begin requiring imports comply with the same production practices as those required in Europe? Uh, let me start from the second to, to clarify that because it's a long going uh, discussion. One thing is to set standards in your market that everybody has to respect. And it's not only the European Union, no? the United States is doing the same. When you look at the residues of what is happening in, in one particular, uh, the food safety issues, the standards have to be the same with the domestic and the important one. And it's completely different debate is what you do in terms of imposing on others in their own uh, level uh, in their market, their own standards. And that's a completely different debate. But this is a discussion that is up uh, in uh, the public domain and it has a lot to do with the manner by which we actually uh, agreed, uh, whenever we agreed uh, in the mid nineties, trade agreements without looking into the environmental implications. And that is a debate that is not only European. The level playing field is something that I've been listening a lot even when I was uh, 20, 20 odd uh, years back in, in the States. And that's a debate that is inescapable. And when these proposals come, let's uh, uh, focus uh, concretely on this. And uh, trying to come with that, I forgot your first question, which is, uh, the first question is if, if it's going to be more difficult to produce products. Yeah, in okay, no, on subsidies. Yeah, no, subsidies. The subsidies, let's be clear. The money that is available is the money that is available. And it's not a matter of the quantity of subsidies. It's a matter of the distribution of subsidies. It's where we need to put the focus. And there is some, and we have made proposals, as others have said, it's a parliament and the council that decide, but we have made uh, proposals for a better distribution of support. But what is also very important, and we tend, and we have the tendency in the European Union to underestimate this. And as a product of the graduate uh, research system of the US, this is one of the areas I focus a lot in Europe, farm advisory systems, extension services matter. The manner by which you don't keep knowledge as a privilege of those that are more advanced, but share this knowledge to everybody is extremely important if you want to overcome some of the concerns that uh, Marta raised, and I hear very often from my environmental friends that every time they hear the, the word productivity, uh, bells ring. Uh, productivity as such is not a bad thing. It's a necessary thing. You cannot escape improving productivity. The thing is how you share that. And this is where much more important about the level of the subsidies is the manner by which member states in the strategic plans are going to focus on what the real needs of their farmers are going to be and try to improve also the distribution of support among them. This is one person from Europe is, is saying, well, of course we're going to require imports comply with the same uh, requirements as you EU uh, farmers have to comply with. Isn't that the way it is now? Which of course under WTO rules is not the way it is now. Um, let's be clear, is it the intent of the European Union to impose the same production practices on imports as would be required under farm to fork? If you, if you mean that, I mean, we have to, when we discuss about these things, we have to be clear. We're not going to go and ask to other countries put 25% of your land in organic farming. But when organic farming comes to the European Union, it has to be organic. This is the difference I mentioned. And we're not going to go and impose on certain member states in your legislation, for example, if you want to use a pesticide that is poison, go ahead and use it. But when your product comes to the European Union, this should show in the residues. And if it shows in the residues, I mean, nobody is going to take a risk in bringing into the United States, for example, a product that is going to be detrimental for the health of uh, US citizens. No, no one would do that, Tassos. Um, and that's why we have a, a codex system, which is recognized in the SPS agreement. The question isn't whether you're going to be importing something that's poison. The question is whether or not the European, if the European Union removes a pro crop protection product and does not allow it to be used within Europe anymore, but it's recognized under the codex system as being safe within certain prescribed limits, and it arrives 
at the European border within those international limits. But then and, and it has been removed within Europe, not for any human health reason, but for reasons more consistent with F um, to F goals. Are you going to prohibit the importation of that product, even though it meets international standards? Well, this is exactly the type of discussion that we have to make when we make a proposal. And when we make a proposal, we're also part of the WTO system and part of the SPS and the codex. And these are exactly the issues that we have to decide when we make this proposal. And when this proposal are made, this is how we're going to be assessed, not only by third uh, parties, but also within the European Union. And if you want, the problem I have with uh, my friends in, uh, in ERS, and when I say friends, I mean real friends. This is the agency that I respect more of all the other agencies in the US is exactly the assumption that what Europe is going to do in the farm to fork is impose this type of restrictions instead of going in through the other routes that I explained before. I might be wrong, but my assessment right now is that when we uh, have to make a proposal, of course, WTO and the SPS agreement are going to be our starting point as well. Uh, that's that's gonna reassure a lot of people and I, I appreciate you making that comment. Um, can we have some input from Jason and uh, Maros on what's been ha said here and, and whether or not you believe that these are not going to have the ramifications on global production that perhaps has been suggested previously? Well, um, so the main reason why we did the study was sort of to get a debate started. Um, and I guess we have done that uh, <laughs> based on the top topics here. And we agree that, um, you know, some of the ways we modeled or some of the assumptions we used are a bit perhaps simplistic or, you know, there's other issues and, and we agree with all that. Um, We're happy to see any other studies that assume something different. Uh, we have been thinking about the organic production side um, and the biggest problem with modeling it is sort of, there's not a whole lot of evidence on how much and what we need for our models on how much it changes production cost, what it does to yields. There's not a whole lot of evidence based on different regions in the world and different commodities, um, but we are thinking about that. Um, and there was an interesting point regarding the uh, pesticide part. Uh, I noted on there that uh, we did not consider what is actually what is actually written in the farm to fork, it says a 50% reduction in pesticide use and risk. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so it says a 50% reduction in use and risk. Uh, the risk part we did not uh, consider, but there's been a lot of points regarding the reduction in products that are available to EU producers. Um, so that would be an interesting point uh, to keep following. I think someone had a QA and a earlier saying there's uh, less than 20%. If the 50% reduction goes in, there'll be less than 20% of the products available to EU producers. And so, I mean, all, all of these things, organic farming, changes in pesticides are obviously going to change the market impacts that we estimate. Um, and we look forward to any study that can provide those evidence. Great, thanks. Um, Marta, we have a few questions on uh, consumer preferences. And, and you mentioned at one point, um, we want to have products sourced locally, as opposed to moving, for example, oranges from South Africa to Europe when they're not in season in Europe. Um, the questions are really, is that consistent with what consumers want? And do European, are European consumers buying into this idea that they will not be able to have as wide variety of food available to them throughout the year? And to Tassos, um, you said that this isn't just a function of supply and demand, but it's also a function of taste and preferences. And the question isn't, isn't taste and preferences demand? And so then really what the, the farm to fork is doing is, or is it 
um, actually trying to manipulate demand as much as supply. Thank you. Bill, I'll uh, give it a go at your first questions in, term of, in terms of uh, what consumers want. And I don't have the data at hands right now, but uh, there are some interesting uh, results from a Eurostat uh, survey that was carried out in terms of what matters to consumers in Europe. And there were some interesting results also about quality. And what I can say is that there is an increasing awareness as to the importance of seasonal and uh, local food. And it's not a matter of protectionism. It's a matter of having food, fruits, vegetables, you name it, that is harvested when it's mature and uh, ripe, when it's ready to be eaten and full of vitamins and antioxidants and whatever else. So there is a greater, um, the, a greater awareness of, of consumers. And there is also what we've seen, for instance, during the COVID outbreak and the lockdowns is that people have come together as communities helping each other out through different solidarity initiatives. And these also translated into supporting local farmers to continue selling their products, whether it be in the global north or in the global south. It also meant citizens coming together to support the most vulnerable in societies to make sure they could access food. So all in all, this is to say, yes, there is greater, there is greater sensitivity, Yes, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of raising awareness and uh, and to just connect it to the question that, that you made to Tasso's taste. I mean, think of the word agriculture. It has culture within. It comes with, you know, with our identity. So much of our identity comes from the food we eat. So yes, there is a lot, a good deal of that element that also impacts our food choices. Thank you, Marta. And there are dozens of questions that we're not going to have time to get to today, but I do appreciate all of the comments from all of the panelists. I think we've certainly opened up a conversation that could go on much longer. And I'm betting as the European Union comes out with its report and then Parliament continues to come out with its position papers that this conversation will continue for the next several years. Thank you to all of you who are participating and, and to the panelists today. Right. Thank you, Bill. And I agree. Um, this conversation could keep going. So thank you so much for facilitating that discussion, Bill. So as we reach the end of our time, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their contributions today and thank all of you in the audience for joining us and submitting your questions. We appreciate your engagement with us and would love to hear your feedback. So please take a moment to share your comments about today's session in the brief survey you will see at the conclusion of this forum. Our next Farm Foundation Forum will take place May 25th and will focus on biologicals in agriculture, innovation, science, and promise. We hope you'll mark your calendars and make plans to join us then. Registration will be open soon, so watch your email and our Farm Foundation social media for more details. So thank you once again for your engagement today, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you. <laughs>